Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, some interesting stuff to go into. I want to go over the social conditioning agenda, how social networks are being used for this and what they're actually pushing for. Uh, some of this will go into how the Chinese Communist Party is using these strategies. Other parts are going to go into, well, how it's being done right here in the United States, in Canada and other countries. And part of that also includes this weird new suicide agenda being pushed for some reason by the Canadian government. Um, including, for example, with suicide activity books aimed at children at a time when they're now making suicide accessible for 14-year-olds, allegedly, or opening the doors, at least, to it. Uh, it's going to be an interesting show today. I also want to get into kind of how psychological warfare operations work. Um, many of you know that you know a lot of my work goes back to 2008 investigating Chinese Communist Party subversion, and a lot of that has also been into their psychological warfare, agenda, kind of um, tools or agendas. I want to explain a bit how these things work. Uh, I do believe that when you, kind of, when you peel back the, the veneer of something and you can see the inner workings of it, it kind of, it kind of breaks the way it functions. And so let's, uh, let's break the way that psychological conditioning functions today. That's going to be an inter interesting show. That said, thank you all so much for being here. Those of you on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, Twitter, we will jump over to Epic TV exclusively after about 25 minutes, so be sure to join us there. Again, it's our uncensored platform, and also uh, some good discussions there. Andy helped this show keep going. So uh, that said, folks, please join us on Epic TV. That's how let's get started. So I want to start off first by kind of doing a broader picture of what's going on with the Chinese Communist Party's systems for psychological warfare operations. Uh, there was actually a new report from the Pentagon, you know, the U.S. Department of Defense, which detailed a new initiative by the CCP specifically for this. And they're calling it a program for what, what they say is, quote, mind dominance. Let me show you this. Epic Times has a story on it. It says, mind dominance, the CCP's disinformation war on U.S. social media. Now, I know a lot of us have become somewhat numb to the word disinformation, but there is real disinformation. I think, unfortunately, the way that the term's been used against us has been more part of a censorship agenda or a political agenda. For example, the whole thing claiming Trump colluded with Russia to spread Russian disinformation. Ironically, that report in and of itself was based on Russian disinformation. Collected um, Christopher Steele collected it from two un un unconfirmed Russian sources or Russian sources with unconfirmed information. The rest is history. Uh, but going back into it, Russian disinformation, Chinese disinformation, this stuff really does exist and is part of a pretty deep agenda. Unfortunately, I think the way that the agenda has been explained is not, not, not really sufficient. And also the way that it's been exposed doesn't actually expose, frankly, what's really going on. So let me show you what Epic Times is saying, because they have a great description of it. Further into the article, they state, The Pentagon's 2022 China Military Power Report, which distills the Defense Department's most authoritative assessment of China's strategy and capabilities, highlights the development of a new method of psychological warfare emerging among, amongst the regime's politico-military leadership. Now it says, the report says that the CCP's military wing, the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, is expanding and evolving its methods for conducting war on the mind in an effort to win real military advantage. And it says, quote, as the PLA seeks to expand the reach, uh, the reach of its influence operations around the world and to seize information dominance on the battlefield, it is researching and developing the next evolution of psychological warfare. And this next evolution of psychological warfare, they say, is called, quote, cognitive domain operations. In other words, operating within a person's mind, cognitive domain operations that leverages subliminal messaging, deep fakes, uh, which is where you can like superimpose someone's face over a video and it looks very realistic. Um, funny enough, that technology was released publicly when there were rumors spreading online that there were videos of like Hillary Clinton abusing children. Suddenly the Defense Department releases publicly the technology to make fake videos like that. Um, 
it was very strange in my opinion, but regardless, the military for some reason made this type of technology public and you can start expecting a lot of fake videos of people to emerge because it, it's come to a point where even even amateur uses of deep fake technology is actually very convincing. But regardless, they say it affects these types of things, including deep fakes, right? Uh, overt propaganda, which is just in the open, and public sentiment analysis, which can be something as simple as kind of trying to understand where people are at on a certain issue. The report describes CDO, again, Cognitive Domain Operations, as a more aggressive form of psychological warfare. And it says it's intended to affect a target's cognition, decision-making, decision and behavior. In short, CDO is the regime's new methodology for breaking the will of an adversary or else manipulating them into behaving in a manner more, more, manner more in accordance with the regime's desires. It says, quote, the goal of CDO is to achieve what the PLA refers to as mind dominance, defined as the use of propaganda as a weapon to influence public opinion to affect change in a nation's social system, likely to create an environment favorable to China and reduce civilian and military resistance to PLA actions. It says PLA articles on CDO, Cognitive Domain Operations, state that seizing mind dominance in the cognitive domain and subduing the enemy without fighting is the highest realm of warfare. Now, in the United States, we call this fifth generation warfare. Uh, the idea is that war has gone from being against the bodies of people to being against the minds of people. You can see examples of this, for example, in Vietnam with the emergence of the idea of total war. Uh, you saw this, for example, very heavily in the war in Afghanistan and war in Iraq, where the United States was talking about COIN, C-O-I-N, that is counterinsurgency. And if you remember, the whole, the whole slogan they had was hearts and minds, hearts and minds. The idea is that you can't really conquer a country unless you, can, unless you conquer the minds of its population. The question is, how do you basically do that while not, well, let's say, while not losing, while not losing essentially what you strive so hard to achieve? Uh, for example, the United States, I'd argue, failed eventually to win over the hearts and minds of Afghanistan. It failed, for example, to win over the hearts and minds of Iraq. And these countries, soon after the U.S. left, went back to the way they were before. The hearts and minds operations did not succeed, in other words. When you get into the Chinese Communist Party's view of this, there's a few different layers to it. Part of it is what you call ideological subversion, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but when you get to the Chinese Communist Party's views of this, this goes into what they call unrestricted warfare, and in particular, one domain of that, which is called the Three Warfares Doctrine. Now, I'll break this all down. I know it's a lot of just terms and so on. Basically, what this means... The Chinese Communist Party has, has basically reestablished what is war. And they look not at, for example, killing a population. Maybe eventually we'll get to that, but for now at least. They don't look at killing a population. They don't look at conquering in the traditional sense. They don't look at bombs and guns and troops and so on. They, they're, not, they're not looking at that. They're saying, what would you achieve through war? What do you get? If you were to wage war in another country, what would you want out of it? Well, ideally, you know, traditional conquerors, you'd get control of the natural resources, you'd get control of the businesses, you'd get control of the government, you'd get control of the culture, and you'd get control of the people. The Chinese Communist Party's system of unrestricted warfare says, how do you achieve that without engaging in conventional warfare? How do you control the population? without shooting people and, you know, rolling tanks into town? How do you control their politicians without having to conquer the country? How do you gain control of the resources, the businesses, etc.? Well, they have different domains for each of these. For businesses, there's economic warfare, there's business warfare, there's financial warfare. For politicians and different leaders, thought leaders of a nation, not just politicians, but even journalists, academics, you know, college professors, uh, people in Hollywood, you name it. Uh, they have different programs, for example, under the Torch program and under the United Front Work Department, both of which work in what they call leadership capture, 
where they bribe and blackmail and get people involved in like underhanded deals or, you know, record them with underage kids, that kind of stuff. Um, and they do this very aggressively. They, they, in fact, have an entire branch of their government and a whole branch of their military dedicated to it. Uh, the former name of the branch of the military was the General Political Department, although they've reformed that now under the strategic, uh, the strategic, I forget the name of it. Uh, back to the point, though. The other side of this, more, more specifically, the strategy the CCP has for psychological warfare operations is called the Three Warfares. And the Three Warfares, is this is actually part of their military code. It's psychological warfare, media warfare, and legal warfare. Uh, media warfare is not just news outlets, it's all outlets of information. It can be social media, it can just be chat rooms, it can be whatever. Um, controlling the outlets of information, something we can see in the United States being done by other groups, for example, with Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and so on, all of which have different censorship policies in line with political agendas. The CCP centralizes that. It's actually a military operation for them. Uh, there's also legal warfare as part of that. Legal warfare is the manipulation of international legal systems. For example, if someone says something the CCP doesn't like, maybe they'll sue them. Maybe they'll sanction them. Uh, that's where you get into legal warfare. Uh, they'll defame them, things like that. And then you get into psychological warfare, which is the main topic we're on today. Psychological warfare, other countries do it as well. Uh, there's many names for it. Uh, we talked about cognitive domain operations. We talk about a uh, coin counterinsurgency in the United States. Uh, we can also talk about worldview warfare. These, you know, there's many names for it. Basically, what it means is that you want to control essentially how people perceive information. You're not necessarily looking to, you know, we talk about propaganda. Uh, we, we talk, which is ma mainly just images or words meant to elicit a certain emotional response to something. We talk about disinformation, which is kind of altering the footnotes of arguments, uh, which actually does tie more directly into this kind of worldview warfare, because once you alter the footnotes, you build narratives on top of the footnotes, and then you can use those to basically kind of alter the perception of reality. Then there's also misinformation, typically just direct false information, uh, which is more more so used to confuse people, to muddy the waters, uh, to, for example, if there is, if, if, for example, people are looking down a rabbit hole and they're finding a lot of accurate information, a, you know, of course, someone engaged in information operations might try to sprinkle in falsehoods so the people looking for breadcrumbs might pick up the falsehoods instead of the breadcrumbs. And then when they start stating, you know, the falsehoods, the organization or group behind it can then start criticizing them of basically being, you know, spreading fake information or even sue them uh, to, you know, take them out of the game entirely. That's how that works. Psychological warfare is not necessarily, again, lying then. Psychological warfare is changing the way people perceive information. And when you get into other strategies with this, this goes back a long way. But let me show you some more. Inf let me show you some more pieces of this. Then we'll delve a bit deeper because I actually want to do. I kind of want to inoculate everybody about on on psychological warfare operations. I want to peel back the lid a, a bit and show you the gears and uh, help you understand how it works. Let me show you something else on China, and then I'm going to get in. After that, we're going to get into the broader strategies, and also how they're being applied in other countries. It's not just the CCP doing this, although I will say they're the most aggressive, and I will say that they're probably the most dangerous. Nikkei has this article. They say, China's online nationalist army. It says, the November protests in China against President Xi Jinping's draconian zero-COVID strategy made global headlines as the biggest public act of anti-government resistance in decades. The demonstrators, some of whom even called for Xi to step down, laid bare frustrations as, as at long lockdowns, again, zero COVID and so on, at long lockdowns that have damaged the economy and people's livelihoods. But some prominent Chinese social media commentators saw a very different universe. These nationalist netizens accused foreign forces of stoking the rage, a conspiratorial idea long used by the ruling Communist Party to discredit opposition. Further in its states, 
The anti-protest backlash highlights a crucial change in the nature of online nationalism in China, a force capable of humbling powerful people and international brands. Such ultra-patriotic campaigns were once, once openly led and directed by state media. Now individuals play a more prominent role. Now, this is something important because this is, this is something the CCP does very aggressively, but other countries also do, which is, you know, when we think about propaganda, when we think about uh, information operations, we typically think like big media, like the big corporate media. We think about Operation Mockingbird, uh, where the CIA, for example, was you know buying buying up journalists or blackmailing journalists. Uh, we think about the direct, you know, Pravda, you know, Russian Soviet era disinformation outlets. We think the state run media and so on. The reality is is that let's the the bottlenecks of information have changed. Uh, the bottlenecks have changed. Now you have TikTok influencers. Now you have YouTubers. Now you have people on Twitter, uh, some of whom have bigger followings than the big media. You know, I, I can say that Crossroads at one before we were censored on YouTube, like, you know, I was getting on average maybe three hundred thousand or more views per video. You know, I, I was rivaling some of the big networks. Just, just Crossroads on YouTube. I'm not. I'm just saying this is an example because there were others like that. There are small YouTube channels that have more influence than major news networks. There are single individuals who have more influence than big networks. And as soon as you hit that, as soon as you hit that pressure point, as soon as you become someone able to influence the psyche of a society, you become a target. You know, they censored me, for example. Um, you know, thank you for being here, by the way, because you're making this possible to keep going. Uh, but they censored a lot of people. And it goes one of two ways. You play the game, and of course you play along with it. You don't get censored. Maybe they even uh, boost your account. Maybe they make you more visible. They help you, right? Uh, you see, for example, some of the some of the more loudmouth people on social media all tend to be now generally the same type. They're all pushing these agendas. We saw, for example, with the World Health Organization advancing what they call the infodemic, the information pandemic, there were people accepting money, YouTubers accepting money from these organizations to push these narratives. People were getting paid to do it. Uh, Biden, for example, hired, this is a separate issue kind of, but Biden, for example, hired this, I don't know what he was, I don't know if he's transgender or whatever, but this very flamboyant gay looking guy with long fingernails to go and do like, you know, propaganda essentially for the White House. Uh, you saw stuff like that. In other words, the influencers, the people who basically are the bottlenecks of information for the public, the people who direct the public psyche, it's now decentralized. And because of that, the role of information operations has now focused on that realm social media, social media influencers. In China, for example, you either play the game or you get arrested. You know, folks like me would be in the gulag, in other words. Uh, but they, there's been, for example, celebrities in China where basically whenever a new information operation emerges in China, you'll start seeing all the online celebrities, all the, all the celebrities, all the online influencers begin to parrot the same basic narrative. People have noticed in the United States, you they see similar things on Twitter, similar phenomena, where, you know, celebrities will start coming out with the same basic keywords, pushing new narratives and so on. It's not clear whether we have exactly the same thing in the U.S., but at the very least, there are, say, corporations and groups with set narratives. They do try to advance using those channels. In China it's actually been exposed pretty well. Uh, for example, there have been celebrities who've accidentally tweeted out the templates. <laughs> they, 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 put, they, they leave like the insert name here part in the tweet, for example, and pe people just laugh at them. You see stuff like that. Um, but what I would say what we're watching, this is important, this whole background I'm explaining is important when we view what's happening right now in the West, when we try to understand what's happening on social media, we try to understand what's happening with information in general. Why are people being censored? Why does the censorship machine, you know, basically work as it is? Why is the FBI so heavily involved in Twitter and all these other websites? 
It's because these are the bottlenecks of public influence. Get that? Now, there's also a clear science behind this. And I want to show you this just so you know it's not just, you know, essentially just governments doing random things or just internet rumor or something like that. Uh, science Direct actually had a very interesting study on this just recently. And let me show you this. It says social media as an incubator of personality and behavioral, behavioral psychopathology, symptom and disorder authenticity of psychosomatic social contagion. That's basically a way of saying that basically social media can influence like social trends that people, for example, maybe among friends or so on, or among kids especially, that once one kid begins to be influenced by a certain online trend, that kid will begin spreading it among their peers. This creates social contagion, uh, where essentially you can alter the culture of a society, you can begin spreading unhealthy or healthy practices among youth. Uh, for example, people have noted that self-harm, like cutting and so on, tends to be a social contagion, as does the whole transsexual thing. Uh, p kids transitioning, it, it, it functions like a social contagion. Now, there's an actual science behind this. Let me show you what Science, uh, science Direct has to say about it. They say, quote, further in, these more recent examples of mental health-related issues appearing with notable uh, penetrance and the social media ecosystem have emerged within the context of a broader fusion and coalescence of individual self-diagnosis. People, for example, you feel there's something wrong with you, or you try to you try to establish an identity for yourself, and you do these online personality tests, or maybe you try to find you know one of the hundred or whatever genders they have now. People try to, especially kids, try to find their identities. They're trying to find ways to identify themselves. So they do these personality quizzes. Um, they begin looking into different categories they can put themselves into. They're trying to find their, their tribe, essentially, right? That's part of it. And also, it includes health, where kids begin looking for health issues they might have. Is there something wrong with me? Are the thoughts I'm having normal? Um, Rather than try to conform to what is normal, a lot of them embrace abnormality and find weird internet, you know, subcultures that embrace any weird whim kids have. This is leading to things they say like self-diagnosis, including depression, anxiety, eating disorders, autism, gender identity related conditions, and so on social media platforms, perhaps most notably on the social media site Tumblr, during the first decade of the 2000s, but also Instagram and recently on TikTok as well. Um, it says further in as well, concerning the broader question of whether social media is casually, sorry, casually related, sorry, causally related to the rise in rates of adolescent mood disorders, self-harm, and suicide since 2010 in the USA and UK, it has been pointed out that the rise of the the rise paralleled the years quote when American teens were obtaining smartphones and becoming daily users of social media platforms such as Instagram. In other words, unhealthy practices are starting to emerge, including suicide. Um, kids are being influenced in certain ways. It appears by social media, by smartphones, and so on, and they're finding different groups or how-to guides and so on believing these behaviors are normal and moving further into them rather than trying to move away from them. Now, that being said, social media can trigger these types of contagions and there are groups doing it intentionally. Elon Musk noted some of this when he talked about the mind virus. We talked about stopping the woke mind virus. And it is true that these do spread through societies very much like viruses. And the Chinese Communist Party has specific strategies to do this, as I would argue other powers do, but the CCP, I'd say, being the main power with it. I'm going to show you some of this. Um, I also want to get into the mechanisms of how this works, including uh, cycles of meaning and symbology. But let's jump over to Epic TV with that first. I also want to show how TikTok is doing this, more, most specifically how TikTok is being used by the Chinese Communist Party to push suicide on the West. 
the Chinese Communist Party is using, well, according to kind of circumstantial evidence, TikTok is encouraging kids to kill themselves. Within just a few minutes of being on the site, they're going to start getting content promoting self-harm. The important thing to note with that is that the content being shown outside of China is very different from content being shown inside of China. And when you understand the CCP, the PLA, Chinese military's agendas with cognitive operations, right? Cognitive domain operations, CDOs. This is actually important because for them, this is military action. For them, this is a military fighting domain and your kids are on it. Or maybe you're on it. And there, there are specific ways you can manipulate people and encourage them to engage in bad practices or things that will even end their lives using these technologies. Uh, that said, let's jump over to Epic TV exclusively for the rest of this. Uh, before we jump over, though, let me show you a quick trailer of Uncle Tom 2, speaking of social contagions. Uh, this documentary does an incredible job exposing not only the, B the Black Lives Matter initiative and so on, but even going into the civil rights movement and showing how the civil rights movement even had a lot of falsehoods, which have become just part of the accepted facts of a society, even though they were not true. Um, it's an important documentary, I think, to kind of unravel what has been happening in America and how we've all been misled about race. Let me show you that trailer, then we'll jump over to Epic TV. Throughout history, black folks were honorable. They had integrity. That's what black people were. We were never taught that America was bad and that we were not Americans. We were raised to love America. Protesters topple a statue of Christopher Columbus and hundreds of statues of vandalized. You see people trying to rewrite history. The American people know these names have to go. Why is that? Whenever you have something to be proud of, people have less of a chance of controlling you. This country is racist from top to bottom, from right to left. And for black people to become a part of that is for them to become, in fact, anti-black and to hate themselves. There is no country in this world that a black person would rather be. Again, that's Uncle Tom 2. You can watch it on Epic TV, so be sure to go to Epic TV. And if you're on there, please watch it. I cannot recommend that documentary enough. Uh, it's, it's very relevant to the topic today as well of psychological warfare operations. Black Americans have been targeted with the psychological warfare operation, and it's been encouraging them to basically abandon patriotism, uh, destroy their, their faith in themselves, I think, and really has been harming them in a way that is being used politically by, I think, very corrupt people. I think that documentary is extremely important to watch. So please watch it again. It's on Epic TV. And that says let's jump over exclusively to Epic TV, and we'll continue going into how these whole systems work. Folks, thank you again so much for being here. 